This is Tommy, he's an engineer at Conical. He's going to be talking about sulfur coupling. Take it away. Thank you. So, you already know my name. You already know where I work. You can reach me on the social media thing, which apparently I, is a good thing. Uh, I'm also elected to the NZ Pug, so if you have questions about what we do and why you should be a member, you really should if you're in this room right now, uh, you can come and talk to me. I'm also the conference director for KiwiPark on next year, which will be in Dunedin. Yes, the best city of all of them. Uh, so if you have questions or ideas or you want to help out or you want to give me lots of money, uh, you can come and talk to me about that as well. I'm going to talk to you about three things today. First, uh, it's going to be a wee bit emotional, a little bit touchy-feely, and I'm going to tell you about a psychology of failure, a personal failing that I have. And I'm going to tell you because I suspect many of you in this room share this particular problem. There will then be an ever so graceful segue into a brief discussion about code coupling and flexibility. And finally, I'm going to tell you about what you've actually come to the talk for. I'm going to make you wait and talk about this thing called connaissance. Hands up, who has heard the word connaissance before? Yeah, awesome. Okay, this is good. This is a good state to be in. If you'd all put your hand up, I would have quit. Um, so here's what happens, right? I am a serial project starter. I write a lot of code, some for work, some for uh, personal projects, because I guess I'm a masochist. And at the start of the project, this is a graph of velocity over time, and it's handwritten so you don't take it too seriously. And in the beginning, because I think I'm an okay programmer, and I take pride in my work, I try and do things well, right? I try and write good code. I exhaustively test all my, all my code. And I think I understand things like the solid principles, and I think I understand the law of Demeter. And in the beginning, I have a code base that I'm proud of, right? It's clean. It has tasteful abstractions, if you want. And that means that I can go really fast. I can fix bugs quickly. I can add new features quickly because I understand the code really well. I can go in, there's no trouble modifying it to do the new thing that I need it to do or to, to fix the bug that I'm trying to fix. And you can kind of see there's a hint here, right? This line is not exactly level. And what happens after a wee while is I wake up one day and I realize that this has happened. I'll wake up and I will need to fix a bug, let's say. The sort of thing I've done hundreds and hundreds of times before on this code base. But this time something's different. The thing that's different this time is these tasteful abstractions that I carefully built at the beginning of the project no longer work for me. Right? Fixing the bug now requires me to rip out code that I had written previously, to change it, to refactor it, and to put new stuff in. Now, sometimes this is easy, right? Sometimes it's as simple as a search and replace throughout the entire code base and, you know, maybe replace one thing with two things or, or something like that. Sometimes it's a lot harder, though, and it takes longer. And eventually, the kind of project velocity levels out, and there's no numbers on these axes, and this is all handwritten, and I've kind of made it more dramatic in order for the uh, presentation to be, to be better. But eventually, I settle on some lower velocity. And at this point, I kind of beat myself up about it, right? I think, ah, I'm clearly not a very good programmer. I clearly don't understand the solid principles, or I wouldn't have written this code that I have now had to delete. Like, what a waste of time. Does this sound familiar to anyone? Is it just me? OK, some people are nodding. <laughs> well, yeah, right. Some people were nodding before I asked, is it just me? <laughs> now, intellectually, I realize that this is a ridiculous thing to be thinking. And the reason why it's ridiculous is because the world is not a static place, right? The world changes. And the software that I'm writing, I'm writing hopefully to solve some real world problem. It is ridiculous to think that my software doesn't have to change over time. And this leads me to think that maybe my priorities were wrong, right? 
And my assertion, the argument that I'm going to make to you now is that as an industry, our priorities when we're designing software, when we're designing code, are often wrong. It seems to me we spend an awful lot of time prioritizing correctness. That is, can we solve this particular problem today? And I think, instead, the most important property of a code base is flexibility to change. And the reason why I think that, there's two things. First of all, if you're the best programmer in the world, if you have the best development team, the best thing you can do is make your software correct today. Right? You can solve today's problem. You can solve today's customer need. But we know that that's not going to be tomorrow's customer need. Right? In a week, in six weeks, their workflow is going to change, the real world will change, and you're going to have to change your software. The second reason, and I think this is much more common, is as a programmer, you have an imperfect understanding of the real world. You are building imperfect models of the problem that you're trying to solve. And a lot of the time, the change that we have to build into our software is because we now understand the problem better. Right? We've delivered the software to our customer, and they've come back and they've said, well, actually, in this case, our workflow is slightly different. Um, or, you know, there's this edge case that you haven't thought about. It does the wrong thing in, in these situations. So we want flexible software. We want code that, is, that responds gracefully to change. But what prevents that in software? When we write code, what prevents us from being able to change it easily? And I was able to quote Benjamin Disraeli before because he happened to say exactly the thing that I wanted to say. And for this next slide, I couldn't find anyone who said what I wanted to say. So I'm going to go on a bit of a narcissistic streak and quote myself. Uh, so I'm going to say the enemy of flexibility is rigid coupling. And remember this quote, right? Because <laughs> this will make more sense at the end of the talk. We're going to come back to it. And hopefully I can convince you all that this is true, right? Imagine for a second a code base where you have lots of things. Maybe they're classes, maybe they're functions, doesn't really matter. And none of them are coupled together. Right? They don't call each other, they don't depend on each other in any way. It would be very easy to change that hypothetical piece of software. Right? You could go in, you could edit any one of those things, and the only thing you would change is the thing that you intended to change. There would be no un uh, unintended consequences from that edit. The problem is, that's not software. It's not even a library. Right? It is completely useless. And in the industry, we have this piece of advice, right? We're all told, or at least I was when I did my degree and learned how to program, you should build software with high cohesion and low coupling. And I find this advice useless. It's correct, right? Yes, we should build software with high cohesion and low coupling. And you'll notice it says low coupling, not no coupling. But there's lots of different types of coupling. And this does not help me write better software. It just doesn't, right? What I would like is I would like a way of being more precise with the low coupling part of this. I would like a way of saying, well, this type of coupling is probably going to cause me more trouble than this type of coupling. I want a taxonomy of coupling. It turns out that thing exists. It's called connaissance, and I'm very pleased that very few of you have heard of it before. Um, it, the, it's a proper English word, and it means two things that are born together, and it implies that they change together over time. You know, they're linked in some way. So you can see how this applies to, to software coupling. I didn't invent the term. It was first coined uh, in 1991, I think, by Mila Page Jones. Since then, a number of people have kind of expanded on the, on the topic. And connaissance is a taxonomy of coupling. So there are lots of different types of connaissance. We're going to go through all of them today, but it's going to be fine. It, it won't be too rushed. This will make more sense soon. We'll come back to this. Let's look at some code, though, because we're all programmers. We love code. Here are two pieces there from different bits of a code base. At the top, it looks like we have some model 
And at the bottom, we have a function that takes an instance of that model. How are these two things coupled? Yes, there is audience participation. Shout out your answer. By name, right? The top one declares a method called set email, and the bottom one calls that set email name. If I change the top one, I have to change the bottom one. And at this point, at least some of you are uncharitably thinking that maybe you want to be in the other room and the other talk looks a lot better. Uh, I promise you this will get better. This is connaissance of name. These two are linked by name. When you change the name of one, you have to change the other. But every piece of connaissance has three properties that you have to consider together. And the first one is strength. Strength is this uh, vertical axis here. And this list of connaissances, we've just looked at connaissance of name, is ordered by strength. Connaissance of name is the weakest connaissance. So it's not that bad, right? The reason why it's weak is because if you wanted to make that refactoring, you could do search and replace in your editor, right? We have tools that help us find all the instances where set email is called and change the name. It wouldn't be that hard a thing to change. So that is the strength of a connaissance. It's basically how hard is this type of coupling going to be to change in the future? There is another instance of connaissance of name on the screen. Can anyone spot it? Anyone at all? Class? Sorry? Class? What about it? It might, but it's not the magic answer I'm looking for. <laughs> so I'll, I'll tell you the, the second instance of coupling is that I have this variable called customer in the parameter list for do something. And on the line afterwards, I'm referencing it, right? If I change the name of this variable, I must also change the line afterwards. Now, at this point, you're all thinking, well, wow, this talk's getting really bad. Like, <laughs> duh, of course. But this is the second property that you have to consider, and it's called locality. And this means how close the two connascent elements are to each other. Now, I said you have to consider all three of these properties together. What this means is that you can trade things off against each other. You can have stronger types of connascence that are close together, or you can have weaker types of connascence that are far apart. What this means is that in your code, you'll have something like this, where red arrows represent strong types of connaissance and green arrows represent weak types of connaissance. There's a very interesting kind of interplay between this idea of having strong types of coupling that's close together and cohesion, but that's a totally different talk, um, but I'll mention it in passing. The third property that you have to consider is the degree, and that is simply how many pieces are affected by this coupling, right? Is it two things? Is it a hundred things? So these three properties together give you the tools you need in order to determine if this is a problem that you ought to be worried about, that you ought to be fixing. So strength, locality, and degree. Strength is the only thing that is predetermined. The locality and the degree depend on your code base. So let's look at some stronger types of connaissance. We've done connaissance of name, which is the weakest. Connaissance of type is when multiple components must agree on the type of an entity. And as Python programmers, Python being a dynamically typed language, we have a very special relationship to connections of type. Again, let's look at some code. Here's a function that uh, gets an iterable of prices, and it does a running total. There is coupling here between the definition of this function and everywhere where this function is called. If I call it like this, the function's gonna work, right? It's gonna give me an answer, but the answer is not gonna be what I want. If I call it like this, who thinks it's gonna give me what I want? Hands up. Who thinks it's not going to give me what I want? Who's too shy to commit to either option? <laughs> yeah. Right, so it turns out, actually, it's still not gonna give me what I want because floating point is a wonderful, wonderful mess. 
But these costs are for products, right? And because we have products, we're probably storing them in a database. So we're also going to have some database table definition somewhere. So the locality of the connaissance in this case actually crosses two code bases because this type cannot store perhaps that answer. So we can end up in weird situations where we have data in our program that is now not representable in our database. We have to consider the entire product and often we'll find locality that crosses code bases or crosses languages. Connections of type though is still at the relatively benign end of the spectrum, right? Let's look at something a wee bit stronger. Connections of meaning is about applying semantic meaning to things that inherently don't have them. If we imagine a code base that does credit card processing, for example, we might have code that looks like this, right? We want to be able to put test card numbers through, and in this case, this is the function that validates um, the credit card numbers. And if you put the test card number in, you want it to always return true. But you're also going to have a function that makes a payment. You're also going to have a function that does a refund. And you're going to have to repeat this magic string literal everywhere in your code. We have connections of meaning between everywhere where we're using this string literal. Now, again, this is easy to fix, right? We can do this. We can store the string literal in a named field, and now we have changed from connaissance of meaning to connaissance of name. We've gone to a weaker form of connaissance, which is good. But there is a trade-off here. In going to a weaker form of connaissance, in reducing the strength, we have also slightly increased the degree, because we now need a place to declare this test card element. Now, maybe in your code base that's a good thing to do, maybe it's not. You can see how connections of meaning is still reasonably easy to change because we could search through our code base and find every instance of this long string. But what about this example? It's exactly the same thing, but now the literal that we're using is going to be a lot harder to find. You're probably going to have the number two all throughout your code base in all sorts of unrelated places. And again, we can make the same refactoring in order, to, uh, in order to fix this. Let's get a wee bit stronger. Connections of position. It's when multiple entities must agree on the order of values. So here we have two pieces of code. You have to imagine that the first one's pulling something from a database. It's probably not going to be you know, static values hard-coded in there. But it's returning a user object, and in this case, it's just a list of values. In our system, we can do dangerous things. But before doing the dangerous things, we check that the user is an administrator. So this code works. But what happens when we decide that we actually need to store middle names? At this point, we have two not very good options. We could store the middle name at the end of the string, but then we still have connections of position because now everywhere that wants to access the middle names has to remember that it's not obvious, it's not logical, it's not first name, middle name, last name. Right? It's something unintuitive, and that's a bit of a problem. Or we can do what's intuitive and store it between the first name and the last name. But at that point, if we miss, if we fail to change even one place where we're doing this check for the administrator, then everyone who was not born in the year zero now can do dangerous things. This is clearly not a good idea. We can improve this by changing the structure. Um, and that fixes that particular problem. You can hopefully see, though, that in this case, if all of the bits of code that use this particular value were very close together in the code base, it'd be a lot easier to change. Right? You could find them all easier because they'd all be in the same file. Connections of position also occurs in API design, this is why if you've read like the clean code advice, they say you should limit the number of um, you know, parameters to a, to a function. It's because if you have lots of parameters, everywhere that you are calling that function, you now have to remember, you know, is it, is it first name, last name, email, or is it email, first name, last name? 
If the types are compatible with each other, you can have a system that you know, doesn't throw an error but doesn't do anything sensible either. Conations of algorithm is when multiple components must agree on a particular algorithm. We're now getting to reasonably strong types of software coupling. Let's imagine a web app at the moment. I don't know what it's for, but users sign up, and when they sign up, they have to provide an email address. And our back end is Python, because of course it is. And we want to make sure that users don't give us completely garbage email addresses. And so we're doing some sort of best effort thing to, to verify that, you know, they didn't give us just their name. And because we're masochists, we're using regular expressions for some reason. But our front end developers, that's all this JavaScript stuff. I don't understand how that works. And they have some library that, you know, validates form input but they're using a different regular expression. So now we have two algorithms that are supposed to do the same thing and they don't agree. We can get into situations where users get errors on the front end, but the back end would happily accept it. What's worse is we can get into a situation where the user front end code works and says, yes, your email address is fine, but the back end doesn't accept it. This also happens a lot in tests where the tests are poorly expressed, where in this particular test, the test author has kind of looked at the production code and has said, ah, you know, they're using an MD5 hash under the hood. I'm going to do the same thing in my test. Instead of testing the intent here, which is that, you know, the hash is unique for different users. We also get connections of algorithm anytime we're taking complex types and serializing it to some simpler medium and then reconstituting it. Anytime you save data to disk, right? What is it? Is it UTF-8? Is it ASCII? Is it UTF-7 because you're doing something with IMAP? We need to think about these things. If the algorithms don't agree, we can have serious issues. So we've looked at the first five and it turns out this isn't bad typesetting. There is actually a reason for the slight gap between conations of algorithm and conations of execution. The reason for that is that the first five conations are called static conations. And that means that you can reason about them knowing nothing other than your source code, right? You can look at your source code, you can find them and you can fix them. The last four are dynamic conations. And in order to reason about those, you have to understand the runtime properties of your system. This has a couple of effects. First of all, it makes them much, much stronger, right? Weird things happen at runtime. It can be very hard to predict exactly what your program is going to do. The second thing it means is that it's actually really hard to come up with small examples that fit on one slide. If I take something that is a dynamic conations and kind of boil it down and remove all the extraneous bits in order to fit it onto a slide, it loses some of its, uh, some of its charm. So we're going to go over the last four very quickly. And some of the examples are perhaps not great. I beg for your forgiveness. The first is conations of execution order which is when multiple, multiple instructions must be run in a very particular order. So the classic thing here is you have some resources and they have to be locked because you're accessing them from multiple threads. These two functions, if I run them on different threads and I am unlucky, will deadlock, right? They are locking and unlocking my mutexes in different order. If you have ever spent a week trying to track this down in a large code base, right now you should feel a kind of chilling dread at this code. So this is a problem, right? This is a very strong conescence. And maybe we can refactor this code in order to not require so many mutexes. Maybe we can't though. Maybe instead of reducing the strength, we can reduce the locality by moving all the code that accesses um, you know, locked or lockable resources to the same file. And that way, when we get a deadlock, we know there's only one file to look at, right? They're easier to find. Maybe we can reduce the degree and eliminate some of the bits of code or refactor them so that, you know, the number of places in which we're having to lock and unlock these mutexes is reduced. 
Conditions of timing is when the timing of you know, multiple instructions is important. This happens a lot in distributed systems. So if you're doing microservices, like my team is at work, we can have this issue where you know, we're talking to some um, account server in multiple places, and because it's an HTTP call and the account server might be down or there might be you know, network issues, we give it a timeout. If the timeout is not the same across all our services, we can have weirdness where the user was able to authenticate, but in some back-end service, several layers deep, something died, right? But it's not consistent across all the services. So now we're trying to debug something, and it becomes uh, hard, to, hard to reason about. Connections of value is about multiple values changing together. Again, we often see this in test code where uh, you have to imagine this is a, a, some checkout system and we're scanning a barcode and then we're asserting that the price that we get out should be a particular value. Note we also have connections of meaning here because 2.5 as a, as a float is not a sensible place to, uh, to store a price. But anyway, this price has business significance. It probably comes from a database. It probably comes from a customer. If we change that, all our test code is going to break despite the fact that the checkout is still working fine. And finally, connections of identity, identity sorry, is when multiple components must reference, this should say, the same identity, uh, sorry, the same entity. So we see this, for example, if you're using an ORM um, that uses the active record pattern, you have an object that represents a row in a database, and if you have multiple pieces of code that need to update that row, they have to talk to the same object. You can't talk to a copy of it. We can also see this sometimes in multi-threading patterns where we can have multiple worker threads that are pulling work items off a queue. And if you want to put work on that queue, you have to talk to that queue, right? You can't talk to another copy of it. So we've now gone through all the connaissances. Hopefully you can see how the ones at the bottom are stronger than the ones at the top. And that when we're refactoring, if we can move our code towards the weaker connaissances or if we can reduce the degree or the locality, we end up with a code base that's more flexible to change, that's easier to change. Throughout this talk, I've been giving links to a website called connaissance.io. Um, I've been preparing this talk for a couple of months, and one of the things that I had trouble with is there's no good single reference for connaissances. I think this is an amazing idea, or I wouldn't be talking to you. So I did what stupid people do and thought, oh, I'll build a website. Like, how hard can it be? But it turns out I'm a terrible, terrible web developer. This is not what I do professionally. Um, I'd be the first to admit that it's awful. And so it's open source, though. Patches are most welcome. If you also like the idea and you'd like to help me with it, please come and talk to me this weekend or afterwards. So I want to try and wrap things up. We started out by saying that the real world is an ever-changing place. It's an ever-evolving place. And our job is to write software that hopefully solves problems in the real world. Because of that, our software has to change. I then went on a narcissistic streak and quoted myself and said, the enemy of flexibility is rigid coupling. And hopefully now this has slightly more significance for you. Hopefully now, at least some of you are thinking, well, I can replace the words rigid coupling with strong connaissances, right? Or connaissances where either the strength or the degree or the locality are high. Um, but, you know, this is a better soundbite. And then we started talking about connaissance. And there's four things I want to leave you with. First of all, we can't just replace the word coupling with the word connaissance, right? That doesn't get us any further forwards. The nice thing about connaissance is it's a taxonomy of coupling. It allows us to look at coupling and divide it into different groups and to reason about them and to talk about their properties. It is a software quality metric. And like all metrics, it's flawed. It's not perfect. The nice thing about connaissance is that with those three properties, only one of them is predetermined, right? The strength is predetermined. The locality and the degree are properties of your code base. So I can't tell you for any particular piece of coupling whether it's worth refactoring it or not, all right? That's only a decision that you can make with understanding of your code base. Thirdly, 
Like design patterns and many other things, it gives us as engineers, as developers, a shared vocabulary. So I can go into a code review with my colleagues and I can say, look, we have connections of algorithm between these different code bases. I really think this is a problem because the degree is high. It allows us to be a lot more expressive in our conversations with each other. And finally, as I've been making these slides, it's been interesting to me how often other principles that we've learned as engineers have kind of popped out of thinking about code in terms of connaissance. So for example, primitive type obsession is connaissance of meaning, right? Yes, it's another word, but when we use connaissance, because we have this more nuanced view, it allows us to reason about our code a bit more. This is all I have, but I will certainly answer any questions that you have. I'll see you turn it on. Um, any questions? Oh, yes. Thank you. Um, the connections of identity example you gave and the name, so the very top and bottom, seem very, very similar. Maybe this isn't the time to drill into that. Um, they do seem similar, but the difference is that identity is dependent on runtime things, right? Whereas name, so let me think of it. Yes, well, in, in, our, in Python and in lots of other things as well, right? Like even in a statically typed language, um, if we think of the active record pattern, I can have a, a row object and I can rename it. So the actual name that I'm referring to can change. The important thing is that I'm referencing that thing in memory, not a copy of it or something like that. Um, but I mean, one of the things is that, i just go back to this list here. I'm not totally satisfied with this, right? This is an evolving idea. And in particular, I've been thinking a lot about how connaissance of type in a dynamically typed language is, I think, significantly further down the list than it appears here. I think this is a, probably a good categorization for a statically typed language. Um, but there's, I, I need to think about that some more. Do you think it's uh, kind of well enough to find, you talk about it as a metric, do you mm. think it would be possible to build an analytic tool that could put out those metrics? Um, I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, I think for these static connaissances, in theory, it is certainly possible to build a tool that will find them all and measure their degree and measure their locality and, and give you advice. I, first of all, I don't think it's possible for the dynamic connaissances. Second of all, I don't think it's a good idea. Um, one of the things that I love about this is that it's not black and white, right? You have to use your head and you have to think about, you know, well, actually in this code base, I'm going to make an exception for, for this reason. Um, however, there are tools out there that approximate this for the static connaissances. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's possible. I'm, I'm not convinced it's a good idea. Over here. Um, thanks for the talk. Uh, can you please um, summarize the difference between strength and degree? Because I'm, I'm not quite sure on the difference sure. between them. Yeah, so um, let's look at connections of algorithms is a very strong form of connaissance. And it's strong because if you have the system, this web app, let's say you're doing this in several places, right? You might have a you know, more distributed um, backend system. It's going to be hard to find all the places that you're validating email addresses. They might be in multiple libraries, but even if they're not, what are you going to search for, right? You can't, I mean, you could try searching for that exact regular expression, but then you're not going to find all the places that use a subtly different way of doing it. So strength is predetermined, and it's based on how hard it's going to be to find that coupling and to fix it. Degree on the other, sorry, uh, locality was the other thing, right? So locality is simply how close together these things are. 
ignore for a second the fact that the second piece of code here is JavaScript, but let's think for a second that these two are actually in the same file. They're right next to each other. If you find the first, you're going to find the second one very easily. Having the code closer together means that as a developer, it's easier to spot the other connascent elements. If they're far apart, it's harder. Right? If these happen to be in separate Python modules in the same code base, then that's a bit harder. If they're in totally separate code bases, that's much harder. So the strength and locality really do um, form this kind of, uh, yeah. So degree is how many places are connected. So here we have two, but maybe there's two more places elsewhere in the code base that also do the same job. Right, so it's about how many things you have to worry about as you're doing your, your refactoring. Um, we've probably got time for one final question, if there is one. Oh, okay. No. Let's give a round of applause for Tommy. Thank you.